Good day, my EOS friends. Wow, we have something special for you today. We have EOS Writer teamed up with the EOS Podcast, the first podcast in EOS history, and we're bringing to you a double episode of Brendan and Dan talking about voice, talking about EOS IO and where it's going, block one, a little bit of info on high fidelity. We go down the rabbit hole in the matrix. As you can imagine, when you talk to Brendan Bloomer and Dan Larimer for almost an hour, you pick some pretty rad nuggets. So thank you, Dimitri from EOS Writer, who is half of this interview. And let's just dive in. Without further ado, here's my first question for Dan and Brendan. I just wanted to geek out with you guys a little bit because I, I, a lot of times I'm talking about this um, like NFTs, blockchain, social media, and virtual reality and how it can kind of um, blur the, the lines between our reality and the computer world. What do you guys What do you guys think of that? Or what are your thoughts on like kind of where that goes down the road? Is that a question of do we live in the matrix already? <laughs> yeah, or like are we going into the matrix? Or you know what's going on? It seems like we're at a tipping point as far as our lives are increasingly digital. Uh-huh. Uh, we've got new forms of value. Our identities are more and more digital. You know, one of our uh, EOSVC projects, High Fidelity, is all about combining virtual reality, augmented reality uh, with EOS. So we're really excited to see how all these things converge. Uh, I actually got my start in virtual reality. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. I, I saw High Fidelity pivoted now to virtual kind of, offices. To virtual offices. Uh, and they're making, the, they're making it open source. They're making their metaverse open source. They had found that a lot of the, they were at, a little history behind it is a lot of the demand for their technology was coming from like work-based applications to bridge communication gaps, and so they saw a bigger commercial opportunity move in that direction at least to start. Um, but yeah, they're a very interesting company. They're actually the, um, the creators of a Second Life. I don't know if you ever heard that. Game. Yeah, Philip Rosendale. I've been trying to get him on the podcast for a while actually, but he's been in stealth mode a little bit with probably Fair. yeah, yeah he's of course. Smart. Yeah, um, um, he's he's a really interesting character. You guys think there's some sort of like inroads for for blockchain and VR at some point? Oh, well, blockchain works with any application that has a database uh, that needs authenticated, secure users. We think that digital assets are uh, going to be the future of so many things, and virtual worlds are full of digital assets. So there's a huge opportunity there. For what about for like ESIO specifically? Uh, ESIO is the most flexible, most powerful, most scalable blockchain, as you know. Uh, so it's ideally suited for dealing with these things. Uh, we have, we can have more assets and trade them and use them in more ways. Um, so we really believe that the development environment we put forward with EOSIO will make it easier for developers to to build these type of things. It's almost like the governance governance could be tested out in virtual worlds. So you get all these full societies with economies and full governance and full structures and everything that we have in the outdoor or in the, in the <coughs> real world, kind of mirrored in the VR world. Well, there are a lot of challenges with the VR world. Um, you know, I think that it's just another interface, an interface that happens to make people sick. <laughs> it's a lot harder to develop for. So I think it's, it's kind of nerdy. Uh, <laughs> It's kind of cool. I'm really impressed with how the technology's advanced since I was doing virtual reality back in 2003. But uh, yeah, I think that the the bigger impacts of, of blockchain will probably exist in the real world mm-hmm. versus the virtual world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then let's talk about the uh, the real world. Let's talk about the the, the token we have. Um, as far as the announcement, I feel like Secure IDs was kind of the the big part of the announcement that was almost like glossed over. For me, it was one of the things that seemed like to be a huge change. Can you tell people other things Unique ID is going to be used for? Like, what what well, what's that impact that going to have? Once you have Unique ID, it solves so many things because people have a reputation that you can build off of Unique IDs. Uh, you can do more decentralized governance solutions. Uh, so it might even be able to, to decentralize the governance of EOS if the community wants to have a combination of democratic and state-weighted voting. Uh, so there's all types of ap- applications, even things like decentralized Uber and <laughs> so forth. Uh, there's lots of people that are trying to solve this problem. And any business that depends upon uh, regulatory compliance in different jurisdictions, you can now do those types of things on the 
blockchain to just smart contract and take into account the jurisdiction of various users without requiring everyone to do, go through all the verification processes to, to do things. So we really think that's providing a lot of value and will enable a whole new realm of, of decentralized applications that are just not possible without it. Uh, for So how are how you planning to do the secure, unique ID? Uh, and sure, we, we, have, we have a number of techniques, um, and it's going to vary based upon jurisdiction uh, and so forth, but uh, it will involve government documents um, to some extent, just for regulatory reasons. But the, the identity information, some of it will be on the blockchain, just your name, but we're not putting your government documents on the blockchain. We're not doxing everyone. Uh, we're just doing the the minimum information so that everyone can audit and know that these are real people. And, and that's just the foundation. We don't believe that every application needs to be built with real ID. Uh, it's just another option to fill a niche and enable a whole new set of opportunities that didn't exist beforehand. There's already tons of platforms which like and EOS is, has pseudo-anonymous accounts and, and people can do that today. So we're actually opening up a new use case uh, which will just create more opportunities for Block one and the US public network. So outside of outside of government IDs or you know, given the correct regulatory environment, outside of government IDs, what ways are there to KYC someone? Um, well, KYC implies government IDs, that's mm -hmm. a regulatory term, but uh, unique user verifications mm -hmm. can be done using social connections. Okay. Um, and we have some very interesting things in the future, but we can't discuss right now. Okay, cool. <laughs> Um, and so there's probably some regulations limiting some of the UX that you guys can provide as far as getting people onboarded really easily there. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, UBI and maybe a tie-in with voice? And if sure. That's, yeah. So this is one of the first applications that strongly benefits from having unique verified users. Every user who signs up for voice gets tokens every single day that they're active on the platform. So you show up, you get tokens. Uh, the, the token model that we're using is uh, people who show up the first year get a lot more tokens than the people who show up the 10th year. Mm -hmm. But every single year, everyone gets the same tokens every single day. It's just So we really want to encourage adoption and then have a nice, stable, uh, steady state so people are given voice daily and they can use that voice to influence the platform. And so the early adopters are going to be, uh, you know, it's going to, you're going to be benefited to, to be there the first year. What about the first month? What about the first? Oh, so that's one of the things why we're doing this phased rollout. Mm -hmm. uh, we now twice now we're collecting a whole bunch of uh, emails of all the people that are interested in signing up uh, to beta test it, and then we can roll it out to everyone at the same time, so everyone can kind of start one at the same place. We don't want to give the first hundred people through the door. A, a huge heads up. So we're trying to make things as fair as possible and also to bootstrap a network. You kind of need to have a lot of people at once so it doesn't feel like an empty room. So you, you throw in a party, you allow everyone, you collect everyone, you let them know, you say, all right, go. So we're doing a, a very strategic phase launch approach. So That makes sense. So you're, you're trying to get the most fair token distribution possible. Yes. Okay. And how, how are the um, you talked about how the tokens would be distributed, or the maybe is there going to be a cap on tokens? Is there going to be inflation? Is there going to be yeah, tokens? Is going to... The number of tokens is proportional to the number of users, and on top of that, there's a small amount of inflation that's used to reward contents that people like. It has a constant uh, 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 process of, of increasing or token supply, but also decreasing them through burning them, through using them in various types of ways. People... So tokens are constantly coming into circulation and out simultaneously. Yeah, when people voice it to move their content to the top, a portion of the tokens are burned. Okay. So it's a dynamic supply uh, based off of a number of variables. So. And how are rewards, what's like, how are the tokenomics around rewards as far as if you post content and it gets a certain amount of upvotes versus uh, voice? Sure. sure. Um, we try to take a lot of lessons from Steemit uh, in building it. and. The, um, it's the number of unique users, not the number of tokens they have. So the more people who like it, the more rewards you get, and it's somewhat exponential uh, at first, but then the, the degree of which 
it's exponential decays as it you just get lots of content. So it really discourages people from just voting for a couple of their friends. Because if you just get one or two likes, you don't really get anything. But if you get hundreds or thousands of likes, you start to get lots of rewards. Um, so that's that's how the like aspect works. The the voice it aspect is actually what differentiates it. Um, voice from Steven. Uh, and the idea here is uh, you discover content that you like uh, and you think other people are going to like it and voice it after you. You voice it, someone comes after you, they voice it, you get your money back plus some. Right? And each time someone voices it, the cost of voicing it goes up. Right? Uh, and so uh, if you find good content Early, uh, you make money, um, or, you, or you earn voice. I guess is the more accurate way of saying it. You earn voice, and that uh, we we believe that those dynamics will encourage people to go and find good content and and bring it to the attention of other people. And it's the people who are spending voice that are driving the visibility of content on the platform, not just the content that other people produce. But when you voice it, you also get to boost your own voice. Uh, in relation to that content. Yeah, your uh, your pixel master analogy I think paints a really good picture of someone for, for people of how that uh, you know how how that dynamic works and how but you're just bumping it down one. So um, yeah. is there a is there a minimum or is if uh, I'm the first comment, let's say, can I voice if I don't voice it, I'm going to be at the top. But let's say I'm the second comment and I can put five voice or a hundred voice, or is there? It, a, it grows by a fixed percentage, thirty it's, percent every time. It's fixed. So okay. it goes from 0.1 voice to you know, 0.13 voice, and, and it keeps going uh, exponentially. So it gets more and more expensive to voice it as it goes on and as the, as the content rises. And then after 24 hours without anyone voicing it, it's locked in, and no one else can voice it. Okay, so if it stays, so there's not a limit on how long something can stay popular or talked about, basically. As, well, the limit is people run out of money willing to, to voice it, because yeah, it gets okay. more and more expensive. Okay, makes sense. And so the, the, the trending, then, is based on the voice yeah. or the upvotes? The voice of The voice it only? The voice it only? You, you can rank it many different ways, but the voice mm -hmm. is going to be the one we're in the future. Okay, and then the rewards for the content creators are, it's an algorithm between well, the... When you voice it, you're rewarding both the previous person who voiced it and the author at the same time. Okay. okay. Uh, and, and then some is burned. So it's kind of split three ways there, and that's going to uh, really make sure that if you produce content that lots of people want to voice, you're rewarded. And then liking is an independent system, so you can get rewards for both being voiced and for being liked. Okay, so the liking is, how big of, how much weight is to the, to the likes? Uh, I don't remember the exact number there, but a couple percent of inflation. We haven't put the full economic model out. Okay. Um, we're still doing a lot of internal uh, financial modeling based on various types of The, the, the inflation variables. rate's a variable that we both weak, but the, there's a fixed amount of inflation that's distributed to likes. And if it's one account, one vote, if I vote, or if I upvote a thousand articles in a day, is it the same if I upvote five articles in a day? No, you can only have uh, a limited number of, you can like things, you can like thousands of things, but It'll diminish there's, the there's, there's only uh, a fixed number of them that count toward the like rewards. And like rewards work similar uh, after something hasn't received a like in 24 hours, okay. it's locked down. So. If you like something that's really popular, it might reserve one of your spots until that one's locked down. Well, these are all very early iterations of the economic yeah. model. So it's likely that there'll be some variations when it actually comes to market um, based off of the, certain types of things. The main thing is this is not a platform uh, where the community is, I guess, in charge of the economics. We're reserving the right to tweak and adjust the economics to provide the right incentives over time. Uh, of course, with complete transparency of, of what's going on. We want to be very why. upfront about that, uh, upfront with that, about that iterative process, um, because we believe that without iteration, there's uh, limited ability to progress. So we're doing something very new, um, and it's going to evolve a lot from year one to year ten. We want to make sure we maintain all that flexibility in the best interest of everyone using the platform, obviously. So yeah, well, we want to make sure that the incentives are that our incentives are aligned to maximize. Uh, with the community's incentives. So that's 
that's the goal of everything we do, is to provide a level playing field for everyone to make sure that we've got a fair, civilized platform, and that if there is uh, rampant abuse by some people, we'll figure out some way of gaming the system that we can create countermeasures in a timely manner to preserve the integrity of the community. Yeah, that's one of the, the, the quick iterations can be one of the big improvements over what we saw happen with Steemit, so that'll be, that'll be wonderful. And the big thing with Steemit is that it lacked the identity. So yeah. what that led to the process was two problems. It was just the inability to autonomously recognize value and distribute it, um, and the inability to prevent an economic model that, because you couldn't rely on identity or unique likes and these types of things, we relied on token balance, or they relied on token balances, and that made it difficult to prevent the wealthier from getting wealthier. So this solves both of those things. Um, and I think that that's what, I think that's a, it's a fundamental game changing, not just on the economics of the token, but the actual whole user experience of the platform. Yeah. And we believe that eventually there'll be lots of voice-like communities governed by different people. So we're not the only people that are setting the rules for tokens, but there'll be variations on it uh, with different distribution models and so forth. So maybe one's focused toward news or one's focused towards um, different subgroups, like, like subreddits on Reddit. So we can really scale. But that's, that's the long-term term vision is to make sure that everyone's got a voice, that everyone is associating with, with the people who they want to associate with. Um, because a lot of the problems with social media is if you're not with like the majority, you get abused. But we want to make sure that both the majority and the minorities have a home on our platform. While making sure that Voice, the company, Block One, stays aligned with its user base. Yep. Everything we do, every monetization strategy, every economic model, every token model, we focus on making sure that our interests don't diverge to a degree where we're ever operating in contrary to what's best for the people. And you said you see a lot of, uh, of other um, almost forks of voice. You, you see other people building platforms utilizing voice. Are you talking about block oh, one building? When we create other... the, the identity on a blockchain, we believe that a lot of people will use that, whether it's for things like uh, decentralized Uber or new governance models or alternative social media takes. Uh, so there's, there's going to be lots of opportunities. And to be quite honest, about how social media scales into subgroups and decentralization and alternative moderation, all these types of things, a lot of it's really going to come down to the evolving regulatory landscape on a global scale. Social media has become very much into the eyes of the regulators. Um, and so how we, you know, we have a certain set of values that we want to offer to the community. Dan's very public about those values. And we're always doing our best to offer them in the context of the legal constraints. And those are extremely high uh, evolution right now, especially for social media. Every country is taking a different approach on content and social media. And it's going to play out in one of many different ways. And so we'll constantly be responding to those variables. And, and all these variables are jurisdiction by jurisdiction yes. basis. So there, you'll see communities, the US community will be different than the Chinese community, Others. which will be different than the Russian community. Or, uh, so it's just it's just uh, serving everyone's needs with custom catered solution is the future, and because it's not a one size fits all on social media. When we, yeah, the the, the existing regulations apply, apply huge constraints on what can and can't be done. So what we're always trying to do is marry our values with what actually can legally be done, uh, and so. You'll, you'll continue to see that in our products. Is that why you guys are in DC? No, I mean, DC is close, biggest close city, Blacksburg. <laughs> right, that works. It's, it's an international city with quick location to Hong Kong and Blacksburg. And, uh, but we are starting to establish uh, some, actually, some offices in, in the area here mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So it's a good, lots of good talent for the types of things we need is in the area. And of course, we're constantly dealing with regulators and and government, so this is an ideal place to interface. The majority of the time we spend with regulators and politicians and stuff is an education-based role. So um, they're very hungry to learn more about blockchain. A lot of them are very receptive. Um, and we have a really good relationship with all of them. So we're focusing on um, continuing to be a pioneer in that education process, uh, hopefully being an ambassador for the whole industry, but obviously it has big implications to our business as well. I saw a... Uh... IBM commercial during the NBA Finals yesterday. Did you guys see that IBM blockchain commercial? I didn't see it. It mentioned, um, they talked about blockchain, they talked about blockchain wallets, and like they kind of, I mean, it was it was pretty, it was pretty, uh, 
eye-opening for me. It seems like it's getting out there. What's your guys' marketing type of, you guys going to be doing you, big you'll see our stuff like that? <laughs> six months. Okay. The first step is to get our community on board um, and make sure, and, and really allow the, the EOS community to go through that beta uh, process, make sure that the product is at really, really ready to bring in mainstream. We'll be marketing, start the marketing yes, we'll, we'll be marketing voice and EOS mm -hmm. Okay. And are you guys going to be doing more interviews and getting out there? I know that it, but uh, leading up to the launch, it kind of, um, you were a little bit stealth mode. Are to you guys going to get out there more? Or? What you should hope is that we don't. Because <laughs> when we're not doing interviews, we're building, right? Yeah, yeah. And they're extremely time consuming. And so what you saw in the early days, you know, me and Dan, we did do a lot because the primary focus was to start spreading the awareness for what we do. But now, um, what I find is that we're getting incremental benefit from these types of things. So what we try to do is kind of concentrate them around specific events and milestones so we can maximize the value without taking away from progress. So that's what you see with V1G, right? So we've spent many months in advance and we're already starting to plan, if you can believe it or not, the next one, uh, a year later. So we're, the lead times of these things are coming up uh, uh, earlier and earlier so that we can make better production and just make things everything more polished. Okay, cool. How about uh, how about the Joe Rogan podcast? How about the what? The Joe Rogan podcast. I think it's it might be the biggest podcast in in the in the world. Um, yeah, uh, never heard of it. I am so busy building things, I can't <laughs> pay attention to all the media. Yeah, yeah, of course. I've heard of it, but I'm, I don't tune uh, in. Okay, well, I've been I've been plugging you guys to to that to them for like six months now. So maybe, <laughs> maybe someday. <laughs> We got a great team of people here to help us interface with the media, and I think uh, you know, we're we're getting to a point where it's easier. And the biggest challenge is all all the marketing, the media engagements until there's the onboarding uh, ramp for voice or even you know public network. It's kind of anticlimactic. Oh, great! And what do I do? And you lose them. So it's a lot of wasted energy. Yeah. Um, and so we want to make sure that everything's there so the first impression. Of users coming in is as high as possible, so you can retain them. Yeah. How is this uh, growing so fast? Like personally for you, how does this grow so fast? Because you're such a free thinker. I've been watching you on social, Telegram, and things like that since BitShares, and all these cool ideas and like kind of big thinking. Um, now that this has grown so big, what's that? What's that like? Are you still? I'm I'm so excited to work from a friend in to have such an amazing team at Block One. That's uh, excited about my values of making the world a better, freer place, and uh, we've got a lot of initiatives on a lot of fronts to, to do that. Um, it's really about laying the groundwork, uh, and that's what voice is. It's the groundwork for more things in the future, and I can't imagine working with a better team uh, or moving faster than what we have here. It's kind of like the best use for these big ideas is have this really good framework to put it into as a, a vehicle to get all that to yeah, market action. Yeah, you know, it, it's. Exciting that we have the resources and everything to make these things happen, but it's it's uh these things take time, and no amount of of money can replace the time it takes to build developers to to prepare the market for the ideas and and so forth. But uh, we have we have big visions. Yeah, for me, Block One is a platform um, to just create more products that, that create more alignment throughout society. I. I'm a big believer that almost all the problems we have can be fixed through alignment. Um, whether it's government or social media platforms, or technology platforms in general, usually the crux of the big issues are, are because there's one group of people that aren't aligned with another. Um, so that's what we're trying to do with voice. That's what we try to do with EOSIO. We try to align the token holders with the block production. Um, so you see that consistent theme about thinking for forth. Transparency, integrity, quality, those are the things we believe in. Has it been harder for you guys when once you got, now that you have basically a, some, a decent amount of funding, is it, is it is it changed at all or has it been hard for you to kind of stay on that, that path? Or are they the... Uh, they have lacking? a lot of funding to double edged sword, you got a lot to lose. So we have to be very careful in everything we do. I think that's the biggest change. Is our, our 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 risk appetite gets adjusted to the amount of faith you know capital in a lot of ways is a lot of faith that the community the community we build in terms yeah. of how much and so when you're when when we're put up on that pedestal you know we have to be very careful about every step that we take because it is different 
Um, and that's been the biggest change. But I think other than that, in terms of our focus, our objectives, our values, really it's just allowed us to expedite our vision at a, at a, high, at a faster rate. Um, yeah. That's it. Yeah, that seems like it was one of the kind of the, the that big fud worry that you hear. It's like, oh, they have too much money, you know, to make, but, but it. Yeah, we're we're trying to be good stewards of everything and making sure that we. Do you know what? The, world. the reality is, it's the opposite, um, uh, because the the public scrutiny that comes along with so much having taken uh, or having been so successful in the token sale, not just from the community but from the whole world. Um, actually, it, 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 it forces focus and commitment, um, 100%. Uh, so I think it's uh, it is exactly the opposite uh, effect on what it actually does. When you know, um, it, it's not like uh, you know, uh, Elon Musk can't just walk away from Tesla. Put it that way. <laughs> you become very committed to what you started. Um, through this process, so it's, I think it's had the, at least for me, it's had 100% the opposite effect. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of pressure to deliver. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I mean, I really appreciate you guys sitting with me. This is, this has been killer. Well, of been, course. Yeah, it's been like, I'm so glad that you can make it. Yeah, it's been amazing. So, uh, so what, what's your take on everything? Uh, I'm excited. Uh, for me, since I've been producing content, and yeah, I was. You know, and steam it for so long. The idea of a new social media platform that has the these fun tokenomics and new model to try out. I'm I'm pumped. I can't wait. And I'm and it gives me a tool that was my entry into blockchain was basically when I finally dove deep was because of steam it. So I think it's like this, yeah, I think it's this tool where now all of a sudden I can bring one of my friends in and be like, Hey, this is blockchain. And it just wasn't until it. it wasn't until I saw I didn't ever even signed up for Steemit, but what what I, I, I was brought into the space on a serious level because of Steemit, because it wasn't until I saw Steemit, not just its technical scalability, but its application, that I had that moment for understanding how broad scale the implications of blockchain was going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, until you like, until it's it's a way to touch and use blockchain and see, oh, that's what it does, as opposed to it's such an abstract thought. It's so you know, out there, people try to wrap their head around it, all these different ways of explaining it. But here, just go, go, go. People do it. need to use it, not yeah. know they're using blockchain. Mm -hmm. And Steemit was the first app to achieve that. And with EOSIO, we're generalizing it, and we're trying to teach and, and demonstrate to other developers how they can make blockchain transparent. I think. I think one of the things you're going to see, people are going to realize, the community is going to realize over the next six months, that by creating a new blockchain-based social media platform with huge on-ramps on uh, into bringing people into the EOS public blockchain, with huge incentives for signups, ultimately then creating uh, a platform, potentially millions of identities that can be used to create identity-enabled applications. You know, the idea of a DAC, right, that everyone's excited about, there isn't a lot of them because they have to autonomously recognize value, right? You need, the blockchain needs to be able to know what's valuable and print these things and you need to be able to create formulaic systems that can be competitive. Well, you need identity for that, for most, almost all applications of it, right? Meaningful applications of it. So without identity, they can be spam, they can be game, these types of things. So really, this is not just a, this is a huge on-ramp, really. This is the type of thing that will take something like the EOS public blockchain and its full potential mainstream. And I think that in six months or so, when the community starts to see what's developing, and they really have a chance to reflect on everything we put forth, they'll realize that there's absolutely nothing we could have done that's bigger for the EOS public blockchain. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, that, that's the thing that's so huge is all of a sudden there's going to be this base, this one account, one vote model or this unique identity. Actually, on the blockchain, there's going to be any the so many apps can pop up. It's just it, what a tool. It's amazing. No, we, we, <clears throat> we learned from Steemit that you can't rely on uh, just stakeholder interest. Like if, if you got a million dollars worth of Steam, you'd think you'd vote for the best interest of the platform. But... Uh, that hypothesis that stake alone drives good behavior was, was disproven by Steemit. Mm -hmm. um, and that was very educational. We're trying to combine those lessons that it's a combination of stake and identity that are, uh, you know, all these things are experiments in some respect, but we have a lot of confidence in what we're doing with, with voice. Yeah, I can't wait, man. I'm, I haven't signed up for the beta yet, but right when I get back to my hotel room, <laughs> it's coming in. <laughs> So Excellent. thank you guys. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thanks.
And now let's hop straight into Dimitri from the EOS Writer interviewing Brendan and Dan. Maybe can we talk a little bit more about the voice? And okay. it seems like um, there's a lot of information that you still have you know, in the background kind of keeping the closer to the best. So maybe can you uh, share a little bit more about what, you know, what, your, what the expectations are from the voice? For instance, the tokenomics part was not very clear. Sure, sure, I can elaborate on that. Um, voice uh, versus the voice. Just try to separate that yeah. um, when, you're, when you're referring to it. Call it voice, and the idea is that we want to have the fairest distribution of tokens to create an economy for ideas. Uh, so every single user uh, has, has their identity verified, and we're trying to make that as easy and seamless as possible. Um, and once that identity has been verified, uh, we can now give users tokens every single day. So one of the things we're doing is we're getting a whole lot of users so that they can all start receiving at the same time. So the early sign-up process is about giving time for people to learn about it, sign up, and so we can onboard everybody and start the races at the same time. Uh, and that's part of our efforts to keep it fair. So the, the token model is going to give uh, people more tokens per day initially, and then it's going to taper off, kind of like Bitcoin does, okay. until eventually there's going to be a constant number of tokens everyone receives per day. But it's going to be uh, it's going to reward the people who sign up early um, in the first year uh, a lot more than people who sign up later years. Um, then, once you have the tokens, there's going to be inflation on top of the tokens. Uh, we're going to create um, tokens proportional to the number of tokens already out there, and those are going to be distributed among all the people who produce content that is liked. It will operate similar to Steemit, except with real identities, one vote per person. It doesn't matter how many tokens you have, your vote mm -hmm. counts uh, equally. Uh, and you know, the reward curve is going to be not linear, mm -hmm. like, like Steemit went to, yeah. um, but a hybrid where it, it's a little bit exponential at first and then goes linear. The idea is we want to reward the content that gets a consensus among a lot of users that, uh, that this content is good, not just content that is liked by a you know a couple of friends. If you and your five friends all get around and like something, it's not going to get so much. But if you get likes from hundreds of people where it's difficult to collude, mm -hmm. that's when the rewards will really start paying off. So we're really trying to address all the lessons I learned from from Steemit of okay. of how power is abused. So Steam, uh, sorry, voice is about having real people. Real votes, likes in this case, we call them likes, not votes. So real people, real likes um, to distribute the rewards. Yeah, I guess that was one of the bigger questions about voice from the community. How do you ensure that uh, your voice is not manipulated? So people were suggesting, you know, creating, what if I create a syndicate of my friends who, you know, they like my posts, I like their posts, and you know, there's as you said, there's a hundred of them, for instance, in that syndicate. How, how do you avoid that? <clears throat> well, the way the reward system has worked, the really popular content on Twitter and Facebook gets hundreds and hundreds and thousands mm -hmm. of likes. Yeah. Uh, we believe that that content's going to far outweigh the syndicates. Um, if there is widespread abuse of, of any particular form, uh, we have plans to allow community governance to deal with it. But it's our hope that with your identity tied to your account and the reputational risk, uh, as well as the social pressure, uh, if you participate in one of these syndicates, everyone's going to know it. It's all transparent. It's right there on the blockchain. So you'd basically have to say, I'm working to game the system. I'm working to steal from everyone else. And it's going to burn your reputation, not mm -hmm. just on voice, but everywhere else in your life. So we think that identity creates powerful incentives for everyone to behave uh, in a much more civilized way. And on a broad level to answer that, that question, one is because everyone is a real person and these are identified accounts, those types of patterns become really easy to spot. 
Um, and the second thing is, is that um, you know, we're designing the algorithms specifically, as he was briefly mentioning in the beginning, to counteract that type of behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Um, in terms of uh, one voice has one identity behind it, um, so there's got to be some sort of a KYC process behind it, I guess? Are, are there any details that you can Yeah, we're, we're working to make a process that's as easy and painless for the users as possible, mm -hmm. that is uh, compatible with as many regulatory environments so we can allow the tokens to be transferred to as many people in as many jurisdictions as possible. Um, but as low a standard as possible mm -hmm. to make things easy. And so, yeah, to, to add on to that is that it, every country is different, right? right. Uh, verifying an identity is in, in China, it's not the same as America, it's not the same yeah. in Europe. So the reality is is that it's a, it's a more complex que uh, answer and it's coming from uh, uh, on a country by country basis, basically. Yeah. So we've been doing a lot of research into ways of doing identity and unique person validation without using government IDs mm -hmm. um, and the like. But okay. um, initially, government IDs will be an element of, of how you sign up uh, to voice. But none of that information that you provided uh, to verify your identity and, and your residence and things like that will be on the blockchain. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to worry about all your information being out there, but your name and your residence will be. Okay. Um, the voice of voice token, O, right? Did you call it O token? Oh, just voice. Just voice, okay. That's not the logo. Oh, that's the logo, it, right? That's the logo for the token. Okay. Um, is, is the token going to be transferable and tradable? Uh, it's, yes, by on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. Okay, so it, it can be traded, right? Yes. People with yes. higher reputation who yes. have more voice tokens. We'll be able to try. Okay. Yes. yes. Now that doesn't allow them to um, manipulate the rewards because the rewards are not mm -hmm. based off of uh, how many voice tokens you have. They're mm -hmm. based off of your identity. But what it does do is it essentially brings transparency to paid influence on the mm -hmm. platform. If you think of how it works in uh, Facebook, is people go and they spend USD and then they put ads in our feeds and we don't know how they're being calculated and it's completely misaligned. The money is going to a group of shareholders um, yeah. and no value gets passed to the users. So the voice token is really just a mechanism we use, right, to create, to, 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 to uh, decentralize that control amongst the user base and give them an equal chance to participate in that, in that type of influence. Social media is an attention economy. Yes. Users have a limited amount of attention uh, and uh, for both what they can see and you basically need to create a means of managing the supply and demand, right? The demand to see content, the demand to promote content and vice versa. The voice token is just the means by which the voice community uh, interacts with each other and finds, discovers the price to have what they say heard by other people. Because mm -hmm. having other people see and hear you is scarce, uh, yeah. and it it prevents the spamming and the uh, other annoying aspects of social media, where people just try to shout louder than other people. You can now be civilized. And you just if you produce good content that other people enjoy hearing, mm -hmm. you've earned the privilege of having your voice heard by other people, sure. and the voice token is what mediates that. Okay. Um, so you brought up Facebook a little bit, I and mean, you're now getting into crosshair of you know, all the social media giants like Twitter and Facebook. Um, I'm not very concerned about Twitter because it seems they're running more or less autonomously, and in terms of the management, they're not they're more friendly, I guess, to other competitors. But Facebook, you know, Zuck is known for crushing competition or willing to crush competition, whether by acquisition or by just stealing their idea. Plus, they're coming out with their own cryptocurrency now. Uh, what do you think? Uh, is I'm going to come on that real quick. So uh, the Facebook token that's been announced is called Global Coin, and it's essentially a pegged token to a basket of currency assets on a global basis. It's really just a stable coin, um, something that we already have many of. Uh, so what they're really doing is they're moving into payments. OK? okay. Um, you can call it cryptocurrency because it sits on a blockchain, but 
I don't. I think it's a far stretch from the values of the blockchain-based uh, ecosystem, and definitely the decentralized ecosystem. Uh, ultimately, what Voice is doing is it's decentralizing um, a lot of the uh, what what would normally take place in something like the ad revenue of Facebook back to the users through attention-based tokens, right? And so ultimately, if Facebook really wants to be competitive to a platform like Voice, they're going to have to accept that the size of their organization would need to shrink by 80 to 90 percent. Um, because when you're taking the value away from the shareholders and you're driving it back to the users themselves, um, uh, there's just a lot, there's a lot of value that the company loses. We're not building Voice to be a $500 billion company. We're building Voice to be a widely used platform that drives most of the value back to the users themselves. Okay. When, when you said you're building Voice to be, um, I guess, the mainstream, more or less, or how do you try, to, how, how will you penetrate that mainstream audience? What will make well, regular non crypto you see, you've seen the event we did yesterday. That's just the first taste of the uh, of what we have planned for getting voice to mainstream users. But ultimately, a bet on voice is a, a bet on the idea of tokenization. Um, ultimately, what we're seeing in tokenization is that by uh, allowing your users to take part in the upside of a platform, right? We're seeing things go from zero to one hundred in record times. We're, it, cryptocurrency is the most viral thing the world's ever seen in terms of time of adoption. And so we, re we firmly believe that by allowing uh, users to participate, um, we think that the rewards are going to be meaningful um, and it's going to be, uh, and that's actually going to drive a ton of adoption. Mm -hmm. And when you take a look at influencers that are sitting on top of large platforms like Facebook, Instagram, you know, they may get paid a million dollars a post to, to do something. But and the reality is on, on equivalent of something like uh, on voice, they may still get paid at, by a million dollars a post by advertisers, but it's very possible that in the future they could make millions of dollars in addition to that in voice tokens if, 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 if it gets the right adoption amongst the public. So we think that the incentives, the upside incentives, are so magnetic that it will actually draw people away from these networks. And when you start with the influencers, which we have a lot of, you know, we're a lot of focus on, um, the, rest is, the rest will follow. So we're not approaching this in a way as, you know, we hope they all come. We're taking a very calculated approach to how we're going to market this and how we're going to start to strip the influencers from existing platforms and move them over to voice. Okay. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of a lot of influencers that have already been deep platforms that are looking for a new home. Yes. Mm -hmm. we, we, we hope to provide that home. Do you have a strategy to specifically target influencers on other platforms? We, we absolutely do. But okay. they'll be very clear in, in short order. Um, it's it's uh, uh, it, absolutely. We're willing in deploying voice in a uh, very methodical, uh, staged, incremental plan. So, mm -hmm. yeah, this event was all about announcing to the world, "Hey, we're here. We're coming for you." <laughs> Start signing up and gathering users. We'll be rolling out parts, and uh, when the time's right, we'll be bringing influencers on board. Got it. Okay. Great. Um, I guess another question or comment that uh, arose yesterday after the meeting, um, there was really not much talk about the roadmap for Block One. So the roadmap was published on EOSI at the same time. We probably should have said something at the event. Okay. Uh, so we call it our strategic vision. Okay. And the idea was that the roadmap is very linear and, it, and it's got dates on it, but we were working on so many things in parallel that a roadmap just doesn't make sense. And a lot of the things we're doing are cutting edge research like EOS VM. And we don't know until we get the results of that research whether or not that's the direction we're ultimately going to go in. Mm -hmm. So we highlighted all the different areas we're researching, the things we hope to achieve, uh, and so you can kind of see the stuff we're thinking about and the stuff we're working on. So that's uh, an entirely new ESIO that was launched last night. Uh, kind of stealth in this yeah. in light of the event, but uh, I encourage you to revisit EOSIO um, to really see, because there's a whole whole story and lots of gems that you could probably pull out of that. Okay. Sounds good. Um, why um, why this, this event was held here in DC? I think there were talks about you guys opening a DC office at some point. 
Uh, is that rumors or? Brendan, why do we do it here? Alrighty, we're, we, so we, we haven't made any public announcement, but we are uh, opening an office in Arlington, Virginia, uh, just right outside DC. Um, and uh, we'll be making that uh, a little bit more public soon. Um, but th to be quite honest, we're already very rooted nearby. So Dan is um, you know, in Blacksburg, and this yeah. is a very close nexus to us. So um, you know, we've, uh, we've been between here and Blacksburg on, on an ongoing basis. So, but yes, we do have plans to and, start expanding uh, beyond mm -hmm. Blacksburg here. And DC is an international city. People from all over the world coming in. It's got great airports, great transportation. It also has a lot of security-led engineers, cryptographers, and things very relevant to the types of people we uh, things we build. So we actually think that this DC Beltway, Arlington, is is one of the most rich talent environments for the type of development work that we do. Mm -hmm. It's also in great proximity to the biggest client in probably the world, right? The U.S. government. <laughs> it's close to all the regulators that we deal with on a regular basis. Regulators, clients, engineers. Um, and because of the DC, it has a, a tremendous international access to all the other international locations that we go. So direct flights to Hong Kong, where our headquarters are, these types of things. So DC is a really convenient place um, for Block One to be building. Um, and so our first step is, you know, a modest expansion into the area. We'll take it from there. Got it. Okay. Um, any plans to move uh, your main office from Hong Kong to here eventually? Um, you know. Main office is a, uh, right now, our, you know, we have an international headquarters, but no immediate plans to move our headquarters to the United States uh, yet. Everything's going to come down to depend on how our business continues to develop, how regulations develop, all these types of things. We'll continue to do whatever's best for the community and what's best for our shareholders. Um, but uh, uh, there's, those things are, 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 are sort of details of structuring opposed to actually any, any, any impact on our business or our products. Um, EOS resources. Um, so I spoke with uh, multiple people who are laymen to the cryptocurrency, and that whole idea kind of gets them pretty confused. Is there, you know, like buying RAM, staking, and all that? Uh, are there any plans to try to solve that problem so that, again, so that EOS goes mainstream? We're trying to set an example with voice. We want to show other developers how they can provide an experience to users where the resource management is on the app developer, not on the end user. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we're eating our own dog food. So we're providing all the RAM for using voice. Users won't have to think about RAM. Uh, and we'll also be providing all the CPU resources for interacting with voice. Now, if users want to interact with other apps on EOS, they might have to uh, acquire some of their own EOS and stake, but we hope that the other apps that they build on will provide that for them as well. So we're trying to set the example. Uh, we're also trying to increase the availability of resources uh, by testing EOS IO with uh, 320 million users and a terabyte of RAM. We know that the network can safely scale as soon as we get all the block producers in full nodes to increase capacity. So RAM can get cheaper in time. Uh, and we also know with things like ESVM that the amount of CPU time per token staked is going to grow up dramatically. And I want to uh, touch on that point that you said. You said, you know, is there, uh, is there ability to make it easier to make it go mainstream? Ultimately, application development and the hosting of that on public blockchains mm -hmm. is never going mainstream. <laughs> it never needs to, right? It's a small subset, uh, subset of, of, of people in the world. A developer, you know, when you're calling up AWS and you're buying elastic hosting packages and stuff, that's not mainstream. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And it never will be because it doesn't need to be. Yeah. The reality is, is I believe wholeheartedly that we've made it about as easy as it's going to get. Now, the real question is, is, is it going to scale? Is it going to get cheaper? And absolutely, that gets into multi-threaded execution and stuff. And we started putting our first steps you know, of that forward yesterday. And Dan can talk a little bit about that if you want to go more detail into it. But at the end of the day, um, when it comes down to when developers are able to buy some RAM, get some RECs for their resources, this is relatively easy compared to other business models on, on other blockchains, which basically start throwing gas transactions or other types of things onto every user action of any of your applications. So what we're actually building is something very similar 
to what exists in non-blockchain-based environments. We agree that the cost over time will continue to go down as blockchain scales, but EOS is already the most scalable when you actually look at what you pay and what you get for what you pay. Um, there's nothing that comes close. Got it. Okay. Um, question about EOS VCs. Uh, are you happy with their work today um, and uh, the pace of their investment in various EOS projects? So uh, EOS VC is just starting, um, and we continue to uh, uh, evolve the program. I actually, there's, there's, there's several investments that we made that we're really very excited about. Um, you know, you're looking at key management from groups like Blizzard Entertainment that started Mythical Games, mm -hmm. um, High Fidelity, these groups. We continue to um, uh, see the EOS community evolve in terms of the maturity of their projects. Ultimately, what we didn't want to do is start uh, funding lots of early stage projects that didn't have the full understanding of what their product was, how they were going to deploy it, what the token economics were. And there's still a big gap in the market. There's a lot of people that say, oh, I want to go build a blockchain-based application. But their ideas and their teams just aren't up the level. And we didn't want to sacrifice that just to start deploying capital. Because ultimately, we want to play the long game and make sure that EOS can win. A lot of the capital has not still been, um, the, the vast majority of it has still not right. been deployed. Now, we're still building the robustness of the EOS VC ecosystem. We're still adding GPs. Uh, to who, who can invest. We're working with those GPs and installing internal teams to help them understand blockchain because it takes a whole ecosystem. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is make sure that the projects are at the level that they're going to succeed. Um, and so we're, we're taking it, we're, we're, we're trying not to get rushed into it. Um, but we're still at the very early stages of that program. We're going for quality over quantity, making sure that the people are talented, like Brendan said. The, the biggest challenge is, is finding the number of teams out there, and we know that will come in time. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, media, we kind of touched base about it a little bit. So uh, most of the media covering crypto-related news is centralized and operated using an old-school newsroom model. What do you think about the concept of a crypto media organization specifically, decentralized and unbiased and tokenized approach? Well, voice is about giving a platform to everyone who wants to enter the business uh, to make it easier for journalists like yourself to monetize what you do, to build an audience, uh, and to be rewarded for producing content that the readers want. The existing media infrastructure is all about what the advertisers want. Uh, we hope by giving everybody voice, uh, not just to voice their opinions, but to decide who the, whose content gets rewarded um, will help reward those who produce the content that meets the market demand uh, of the readers rather than the demand of the advertisers. So uh, we really hope that Voice creates a really more marketplace for ideas. Um, we also, um, we partnered at EOS Rider with a company called Moran in China, and they're covering you know, that whole region, which is gigantic. You know, the, the number of crypto users there is easily 10 times, 100 times to what we have here in the Western world. Um, there were some questions coming from the Chinese audience asking, um, because of the coverage of EOS, because of the interest in EOS in China, um, why are you guys not doing any of the events in mainland China, like uh, hackathons or events like this? Are you planning to do any of them in, in China? Uh, yeah. Um... We do have uh, plans for China, and we and we and we still do have um, you know an active approach in terms of how we communicate with China. Um, but China is a very very different regulatory environment, and so the way that we approach China is operating in the constraints of that environment. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Keep really doing the great work. Time. Thank you. And a big thank you to Dan and Brendan from the EOS Writer and the EOS Podcast. As you guys may have started to get inklings of the EOS Podcast, the first podcast in the history of EOS and the EOS Writer have been teaming up on some big media projects lately, and we're going to continue that relationship. So uh, what's been cool about the EOS Writer is to see them jump on the scene as one of the main media sources that's trusted for very quality curated and most importantly very timely information about eos so if you guys are looking for somewhere to find what's really going on in eos right now 
the EOS writer is what is really going on right now. So check it out. Uh, also check out the EOS podcast. Cheers, my EOS friends. This was what an honor. What what an absolute honor to get to talk to Brendan and Dan and meet so many people from the, the EOS community. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure I speak for Dimitri as well when I say that um, – so many quality minds and people is just uh, what a beautiful experience to be in dc for the announcement much love to each and every one of you my eos friends this is rad you know we do this because we all love it so uh really proud to be a part of this with all you cheers the money is not the prime asset in life